Okay, well, great to see so many people. Thanks for coming. Um, my job this morning, really, uh, voluntarily, is to try to convince you that uh, if you're new to this field, that this technology does work. Uh, I'm going to be demonstrating that through uh, research and uh, some real world evidence as well. So um, I encourage you to ask questions uh, at the end. Um, and if we don't have enough time, then uh, I'm happy to talk to you uh, outside. But really what I want to oh, disclosure, I'm the chief scientific officer of IMAC Regeneration Centers. Um, really what I want to do here today is give you a sort of overview of what regenerative medicine is and perhaps maybe more importantly what it isn't. Um, there's a lot of confusion and if you're coming to these meetings for the first time you're going to hear a lot of words that you don't necessarily understand, um, are perhaps a little confusing. So this might form a sort of fundamental basis, a foundation for everything else you're going to hear uh, in the rest of the conference. So um, that's what I hope to achieve. Um, if there's any confusion uh, when I finish, uh, let me know and I'll try to clarify any points. Um, I'm going to go through uh, this list here, a quick introduction. I'm going to talk about homeostasis versus tissue regeneration, focus a little bit on research, and then I'll conclude with a few uh, real world um, um, cases. So I, I really like this slide. I stole this off somebody, um, I think, from one of the, my first Boston BioLifes. Um, and it actually is attributed to Albert Einstein. Um, I looked it up because I know a lot of these things are, are bogus. But, um, what he says is, if you can't communicate something to a six-year-old, you don't fully understand it um, yourself. And I think that that's really important when we're talking about a field like this that's so confusing. So I'm going to try to distill everything down, make it simple so that um, it's digestible and, and easy to understand. I'm not saying you're a room of six-year-olds. I'm just saying that it's going to be my job to try to make it as simple as possible so that we understand um, where we're starting from. So let me start by asking you a question. With a show of hands, how many people in this room are currently alive? Okay, so most of you. All right, that's good. Okay. The reason you're alive is because of stem cells. Stem cells in your body are regenerating your body on a daily basis. In fact, since I started talking, you've probably blown through about 300 million cells um, in your body already. And those have to be replaced on a, on a daily basis. There's stem cells, there are stem cells in every single tissue of your body, with perhaps the exception of the heart, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit later. But without a stem cell pool in your body, you would expire very rapidly, and in fact, that's why we age and, and die. Um, but we know that there are stem cells because we're alive, because when we injure ourselves, if we cut ourselves shaving, it heals. If we bite our cheek or our, our, our tongue, it heals. Um, What's different is that we can't lose, say, uh, a limb and have that grow back, but our body is constantly regenerating. That's homeostasis. That's the constant renewal of cells in the body that, that, that keeps us alive. So when people say that regenerative medicine doesn't work, it makes no sense, that's completely bogus because we're regenerating every single day. Um, the only reason we start to see problems is when that process starts to fail. So when we look at older patients, and we see they start having knee issues or cognitive issues, there's a decline typically in the stem cell pool. And one of the things we do in our clinics is we see a lot of elderly people with, with knee um, conditions. And we have to supplement the body's own ability to regenerate that tissue with exogenous product. So maybe that's adipose, maybe that's bone marrow, maybe that's a perinatal product. But those products don't do anything magical all they're doing is revitalizing the body's own ability to heal itself. It's instructing the body in its own process of healing. So this is why we age. We age because as time goes by, we deplete um, the, the stem cell pools in our body, but our demand is constantly going up. Because we have a thing called telomeres, which um, I'm not going into the, the details of that, but as a stem cell divides, at the end of the chromosomes, you need to have primers that were able to copy the DNA, but every time that happens, you lose a portion of that tip. And as it gets shorter and shorter, eventually you get to a point where you're now losing coding DNA and the cell has to die. So we're constantly uh, losing 
cells. And if you're here on Saturday, uh, I, th I think it's Saturday I'm speaking again, I'm going to talk more about the, the aging process and the fact that aging is an evolutionary conserved mechanism to remove us from the environment. We need, as a species, in order to be successful, we need a way to get rid of the, the old and bring in the new. And so we have an aging process that degrades the body, it depletes the stem cell pools, and removes us. So that's what we're fighting against as regenerative medicine scientists. Um, the ability to not trick the body, but encourage the body to do what it's been doing your whole life and uh, reinvigorate it. So we have a lot of tools in order to do that. Um, there are people in this room that have experience with using bone marrow, with adipose. Um, I particularly prefer uh, umbilical cord derived products or perinatal um, products. And the reason for that I'll get into, but I, I just threw this slide in because I think it's a good opportunity to really explain the difference between what stem cell biology is and what regenerative medicine is. So I have a PhD in stem cell biology, but I work in the field of regenerative medicine. Now, when we're talking about bone marrow, when we're talking about adipose, when we're talking about perinatal products, we're not really talking about stem cells. We use that term as a throwaway term, but it's not really an accurate term because for the most part, there are few, if any, stem cells in any of these products, but there are regenerative cells. So you might argue, well, what about MSCs? Well, we've been arguing for a long time that MSCs aren't canonical stem cells. In fact, they were um, incorrectly named by Arnold Kaplan, he now agrees with that. Some people say that it's for financial reasons, he's changing the nomenclature, but um, we've been arguing for a long time as stem cell biologists and, bio, uh, and, um, and cell biologists that they're not canonical stem cells. They, they don't behave in the body like stem cells. So we prefer to use the term mesenchymal signaling cell or you know, a derivation of that. Um, so those are the cells you typically get from, from adipose. The cells you're typically getting from bone marrow are mostly hematopoietic stem cells. Um, here, the hematopoietic stem, hematopoietic stem cells reside in the osteoblastic niche, and when they're activated, when there's an injury, these stem cells undergo um, a, a, a transition from the osteoblastic niche to the endothelial niche, where they undergo proliferation and differentiation before then um, migrating into the circulation. So there's a maturation process in this bone marrow. When we take the bone marrow and we use it therapeutically, these are still immature stem cells, so they're not actually very therapeutic. But there are a lot of other mature leukocytes, um, epithelial cells, all these other cells, some MSCs, all these cells contribute to regeneration. So if you hear people arguing, well, we've got the most MSCs, or you can only use products with MSCs because you can only use true stem cells, it's not an accurate statement. There are regenerative cells in adipose, there are regenerative cells in bone, and there are regenerative cells in perinatal tissue. I, again, like I said, I personally just prefer working with perinatal tissue, um, and this slide is not mine, but it, it, it demonstrates nicely that as we age, so going from newborn to a teen, there's a precipitous drop in activity in our um, MSC pools, and in fact, all of our regenerative cells. So taking perinatal um, cells, they're very robust in their regenerative potential, and that declines very rapidly. So if you've got patients that are in their 60s, and you're using autologous cells, you're not really giving them the best chance. It's like giving um, um, a, a race car without, um, uh, without a very good engine. Um, you, know, you really want to use the, the highest quality uh, product that can provide the um, most robust regenerative cytokines and proteins. So another misnomer is that the cells that we, de um, that we deliver are directly differentiating into tissue. So we, ha we hear arguments that you can only use adipose for cartilage because the MSCs have demonstrated the ability to differentiate into chondrocytes and other cells, ad adipocytes. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. We don't have any convincing data that in vivo we take cells from the patient or we take allogeneic cells, we introduce them, and they differentiate into the tissue that's needed. What seems to be happening is that those cells signal to your endogenous cells. So we take bone marrow, we take adipose, we take perinatal cells, we take exosomes. These are all signaling modalities that reactivate your endogenous ability to regenerate. In fact, MSCs have been demonstrated to find sick cells and form microtubules and shuttle um, mitochondria through those microtubules in order to reinvigorate the, the endogenous cell. So it's like giving a battery pack to a sick 
um, uh, cell. It reinvigorates it, it reinstructs it, um, and, and activates its regenerative process. So that, you've probably heard the term uh, uh, paracrine signaling before. Um, that was how we sort of described the mechanism of MSCs for a long time, and now we're really understanding that that paracrine mechanism is uh, mediated through exosomes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, exosomes, and I, I work mostly with exosomes currently. But um, here's just a quick slide from my, one of, uh, a book chapter that I wrote about MSCs, and here we're still referring to them as stem cells, but um, we now refer to them as mesenchymal signaling cells or stromal cells. Um, but this is just another example of the, the potency of what these cells can do. So not only do they instruct endogenous cells um, to induce repair, but they're very potent when it comes to immunomodulation. So MSCs, through the liberation of exosomes, are able to uh, alter the Th response from a Th1 to a Th2, a macrophage response from M1 to an M2. So turning the immune response from a, um, a pro-inflammatory, which you know, you need a little bit of inflammation when you're talking about regeneration. But when we're talking about illnesses, typically we've gone past the point of, um, of helpful inflammation and we really want to modulate that inflammation. So um, uh, these, uh, these cells can modulate a, a switch from pro-inflammation to pro-regeneration um, immune responses. So that's homeostasis, so your body is constantly kicking over, it's constantly repairing, um, and we age because that process just eventually slows down and, and then stops. But what about tissue regeneration? Well, if you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard, seen this slide, because this is my favorite slide. Uh, I saw this slide when I was a student, when I was a PhD student um, at one of the conferences that I was attending, and it, I was gonna say, literally blew my mind, it didn't, figuratively blew my mind. And um, I couldn't believe that we in our um, scientific community are able to observe such an incredible phenomenon as an entire limb growing back on a, on a chordate, on a, on a species that's not too different from us. So the, the question that I asked myself, well, if this guy can do it, you know, why can't we do it? You know, what's, what's different? So I really started delving into the science and try to understand what regenerative medicine is and how tissue regenerates. And um, these are not my publications, but you can find these uh, online. These are some seminal um, observations about tissue regeneration. And in summary, what these talk about are the role of nerves in tissue regeneration. Now, I can't state that enough. Nerves are incredibly important when it comes to tissue regeneration. And in fact, without nerves, you can't regenerate tissue. If you look at diabetic patients and they have peripheral neuropathies, they often get ulcers and necrosis and everything because their nerves are dying back. And when the nerves die back, the endothelium, the blood vessels, don't get the signaling that they require. Because the relationship between the nerves and the blood vessels is very intimate. In fact, during ontogeny, when the fetus is developing and the, the, uh, the nerves are growing, the blood vessels and the nerves follow one another. And the relationship's so tight that, in fact, if you experimentally change the trajectory of the nerves, the blood vessels turn and follow the nerves. So there's a very tight relationship between blood vessels and nerves. And of course, if you have tissue, you need to perfuse it. You need blood vessels. If you don't have blood vessels, you get necrosis. And so I really jumped on this idea of the relationship between um, nerves and blood vessels. Um, here, if you're interested, just quickly, this experiment was um, demonstrating the role of nerves in tissue regeneration by resecting the, the limb of the axetol here. The, um, the limb you know, would normally regrow, but if they denervated upstream, if they killed the upstream nerves, the limb wouldn't regrow. You wouldn't get any blood vessel formation, you wouldn't get any tissue regeneration. Um, uh, this is just a, a, a fun observation that uh, there's a prediction that we're going to have this ability within the next few years based on um, you know, how quickly this field is growing. Um, and in fact, here's a, a somewhat recent paper, 2018, uh, talking about just the use of CD34 umbilical cord derived cells used topically on, on wounds. And it's a, just a topical um, application. And what this does, it actually induces nerve growth um, in the skin and, uh, and mediates regeneration. So onto my research, um, like I said, I was really interested in this role of, uh, of peripheral nerves. And the lab that I was in at the University of Miami at the time was a cardiac um, lab. Uh, the University of Miami um, Interdisciplinary Stem Cell Institute, we had a focus on cardiac regeneration. And I was really interested in, um, Mike, the time is not going, by the way. 
I don't know how much time I have left. Um, I was really interested in why the human heart has this inability to regenerate. Why is it that you can regenerate intestinal tissue, skin, liver, but you can't regenerate the heart? And there was a, a seminal paper published in 2011 by um, Enzo Perello in Science that demonstrated that, in fact, we do retain an ability to uh, regenerate our heart, but only for the first day or two of life. So if we're talking about the salamander, if we're talking about the zebrafish, they retain this ability to, to, to um, uh, regenerate their hearts. But as you get larger, multicellular, you, know, uh, 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 you have um, a greater blood flow, that, in, that, um, that causes, or that, um, sorry, that um, leads to an increase in blood pressure. And that increase in blood pressure puts stress on the heart. So inside the left ventricle, you've got about 180 millimeters of mercury pressure. So if you try to regenerate that tissue after an infarct, you're going to get a rupture. So evolutionarily, we've evolved um, a process to actually prevent the heart from, from regenerating, which seems counterintuitive, but the idea is you've just got to get to reproductive age and then you can you get out of here because you have a progressive heart failure anyway. But it's really fascinating that as we grow, as our volume increases and as our blood pressure goes up, the ability to regenerate the heart decreases. So if you take a neonate, and in fact, what I've um, done here, I recreated the experiment that Enzo Perello did where he took the neonatal mouse um, and he resected the apical portion of the left ventricle. He reinserted it back into the mouse, sutured up the, the ribs, gave the pup back to the mother, and then over 21 days documented the regeneration of that tissue. But what was interesting is if he tried that after seven days, there was no regeneration whatsoever. It was only the first one or two days after birth um, that the heart retained this ability. So there's some kind of switch that happens after birth that renders the heart incapable of regeneration. So I hypothesize that maybe it's got something to do with the nerves. So in the hundred or so years we've been studying the, the heart, we've never really seen the peripheral uh, nerve plexus of the heart. So I generated a mouse model where, uh, and I won't go into the details, but basically um, the neural crest derived cells that generate the, the nerves of the heart are all labeled with uh, a fluorescent dye. So under a, a microscope, I'm able to see for the first time all of these um, sympathetic nerves of, of the heart. And this actually um, was featured on the cover. It won an award because this is the first time we've been able to actually visualize the, 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 um, the nerves rather than having to indirectly measure their impulses. So now I had this model. What I wanted to ask was, just like that salamander, if we denovate the tissue, do we remove the ability of the heart to, to regenerate? So are, are the nerves of the heart fundamental to the regeneration of the neonatal heart. And um, cut a long story short, that, that turned out to be the case. Um, you can't really see it very well here, but if you have the slides, um, what I did was I, I resected the apical portion of the heart, just like uh, Enzo Perello did. Uh, I gave the, the, the pups back to the mother, and over time, um, they regrew the, the apical portion. But some of the mice I gave 6-OHDA, which is toxic for sympathetic nerves. And what you can see here is that this is the um, uh, this is just bright field, oh, it's actually it's fluorescence, but it's not colored, it's not pseudo-colored. Um, you can see the live, intact nerves here. With 6-OHDA, all of these nerves start undergoing Wallerian degeneration and, and um, destruction. In the, native, in the normal mouse, the untreated mouse, you can see that this is um, a few days in, you can see that these um, nerves are actually growing back into the uh, area that was damaged. So we've got a lot of extracellular matrix here, the nerves are growing back in, which are then pulling the blood vessels and then um, repopulating the tissue with cardiomyocytes. When you kill the nerves, you lose that ability. So here, the control, you can see the apex is grown back. There's a tiny little bit of scarring that you can barely see here that's blue. And what's interesting, I won't go into this, but this is a conversation for another time, there's a lot of adipose epicardial adipose around the heart after injury. And that's um, a very interesting observation that I didn't have the chance to follow up with um, just yet. But um, when you denovate, you completely lose that ability um, to, to regenerate the heart. You can see here, um, uh, relative area, um, denovated heart, um, it's, it's, it's much worse if you, um, if you kill the nerves. So studying this a little bit more, I tried to understand, well, okay, the nerves are contributing something. What are they contributing? How are the blood vessels involved? And so um, there are a few factors that are liberated um, from blood vessels after there's an, a nerve impulse. So after you get a nerve impulse, uh, factors like neuregulin 1 are released from blood vessels that bind to the surface of cardiomyocytes and induce their um, proliferation. 
So I hypothesized, if I took a few of those factors that the, the cells that are mediating re tissue regeneration, if I took a few of those factors and I used them, just those alone, could I recreate regeneration in the Petri dish? And so, uh, I know, again, a, a long story short, I had to generate a whole new model here where I could actually grow hearts in a Petri dish because previously, if you take a, a neonatal heart from a, a mouse and you put it in a Petri dish, it's dying. You know, there's, it's, it's going to be, it, from the moment you take it out of the body, it's dying, and then after about three days, all you end up with is this coagulative necrosis. See, the heart has shrunk um, here. This is a cross-section um, through the heart and then stained with hematoxylin. Um, that if you look sort of close up, you can see there's nothing here. It's all coagulative necrosis. There's nothing here. But I generated this model where I can actually keep the heart alive, and I don't have the video here today, but um, these hearts continue beating up to 14 days and, and past in the Petri dish. And if you look at the cardiomyocytes, you can see these uh, active sarcomeres, nuclei, and the, um, the, the cells are via the, um, all the cells are viable. So with this factor, neregulin, um, I was able to keep the, the cells alive, here's just a little tiny bit of science, um, through the activation of um, uh, AKT, so phosphorylation of AKT, we add neregulin here, we get an activation of um, AKT. And AKT is a pro-survival anti-apoptosis um, factor, um, and that was very important in keeping these cells um, alive in culture. And so what did I see? Well, if you just look at a, a native heart, there's very little proliferation in the epicardium. And if you remember before, I said that every, body, every um, organ in the body has stem cells, except perhaps for the exception of the heart. Well, that's basically true, that all the evidence is pointing in that direction now. But that doesn't mean the heart can't regenerate. And this is sort of the point of all this, that stem cells aren't the be-all and end-all. You know, I'm talking about endogenous stem cells, not cellular therapy. There are other cells in the body, lots of cells, lots of different cell types that we are still yet to study or that there are um, studies ongoing that mediate repair. And in the heart is the epicardium. The epicardium is the tissue in the body of the heart that mediates repair. And so what you're seeing here is uh, at, at, at base, there are basically no epicardial cells proliferating. So the epicardium is a single layer of cells that go all the way around the heart. It was thought to be non-functional, but uh, now we know that's not the case. When we add the neregulin and a couple of other factors that are also produced by um, the, the, um, the endothelium and, in fact, um, cellular therapies um, are high in these factors um, also. When we, pro when we um, provide these factors, we see this proliferation of the epicardium. And you can see here the number of epicardial cells has increased. And it, it, what's a little bit harder to see, but it's a little bit more dramatic, um, and a two-day-old mouse, you've just got this single layer of brown epicardial cells. But when you stimulate with these, these growth factors, you get this proliferation and thickening of the epicardium, which is actually what happens after you have a heart attack as well. So this is activating uh, regeneration. And so I took this one step further and took that model and I injured it. I took a, a small slice out of the apex of the heart and I put it back in the Petri dish. And I added these factors, and what I noticed over time was that first you get this filling of the, the space with extracellular matrix, and then this complete recellularization, complete regeneration of the tissue. Here, this is a cross-section. You can see that the cells are starting to migrate in. There's a lot of extracellular matrix here. And by day 21, this is completely regenerated with very little scarring, hardly any scarring at all, but completely recellularized. Here, you can see the scarring a little bit better. Here, this is uh, EDU, which uh, identifies proliferating cells. So you can see the rest of the heart is dark. In this little triangle that was, that was injured, all these proliferating cells. Here's another example of that, the epicardium proliferating on the outside of the heart. Nothing else proliferating inside the heart. These are all nuclei. All that blue is just a cellular nuclei. There is nothing else proliferating inside the heart, only the epicardium. Those cells go into this injury site. You can see here all these proliferating, and they mediate the, the repair of the, of the heart. Um, just to demonstrate that this is, in fact, the epicardium that's mediating repair, I generated another mouse model. I won't go into the details of how I generated that. But basically, all the tissue in the body is red except the epicardium. The epicardium are the only cells in the body that are green. And when I injure the, uh, the heart, what you see is that these cells migrate in and start mediating the regenerative response. Here's another um, 3D example. So when people argue that cellular therapy doesn't work, that stem cells don't work, that the cells can't find injury, which um, is complete nonsense, um, I like to show this slide. So this is another uh, um, 
neonatal mouse heart, so a, a one to two day old mouse heart that's been now in culture for a few days. And what I've done here is I've taken actual stem cells. So in this case, I, I, I started with stem cells and then I differentiated them to, to um, epicardial cells. So this is another sort of a, a sideline. This is another example of how um, when we're talking about stem cells, we're not really talking about stem cells mediating regeneration because they typically take too long to differentiate. In this case, to go from a, a stem cell to an epicardial cell takes 30 days. So if you're injecting cells into a patient, those cells aren't around for 30 days. So they don't have time to differentiate and become that tissue or do anything else. So that's another reason why um, we know that it's uh, uh, other regenerative cells that are contributing. So anyway, I, I, I made these cells epicardial cells, and I just simply dripped them in the, uh, close to the heart or on the heart. And what you can see here is that these injuries that I created, one here, one here, one here, all of these regenerative cells home to the site of injury. So if you've got a patient with an injury and you give an IV infusion of cellular therapy, these cells know where to go. They find sites of inflammation, they, they find um, uh, areas where they need to engraft, they go there, they mediate repair, and then they're gone. A few days after this, you will not see any of these cells. It's all endo endogenous repair um, after this. These, they simply instruct the environment how to repair, and then they're gone. So that was in vitro, but what about in vivo? It's a lot more relevant if we're talking about a live system. So uh, this is the experiment that I referred to um, before where I took a mouse, uh, and the mice are uh, plachiotherms, so you can actually take them, put them on ice, and they become immobile. The, the heart stops, the blood stops pumping, um, and you can actually operate on them just by purely uh, laying them on ice. Um, so what we do here is we make an incision around the fourth intercostal, and I pull out the heart with a modified 30 gauge needle. I just pull it through the chest cavity. And then I resect the apical portion of the heart right there. I put the heart back in, actually a single suture, some super glue, put it back with the, the mother. And um, oh, so that, that's, the, that's the main model. In this case, what I did was then I took those same cells that I, that I stained with a fluorescent green and I dripped them into the chest cavity. So again, when we talk about regenerative medicine, and especially when we talk about cardiology, there are all these very special tools to try to get into the heart and inject around sites of injury and everything like that. All I did in this case was drip into the chest cavity. I didn't give the cells any instruction or anything, but they knew where to go. So it's a little light in here, but if you've got the slides on your computer, you'll see that this is eight days after operation. After I made this injury here, you can see now that it's already sort of filled up. There's a lot of extracellular matrix in there. And if you look closely, that whole area, nowhere else, only this area of injury contains those stem cells. So those stem cells are finding the injury and mediating repair. By day 21, this mouse is completely re regenerated. But it's mediated by these cells. So I spent 20 years in academia uh, working on this, uh, you know, won some awards, but I could never get grants for, for any of this work. So uh, last year or two years ago now, I, I made the transition from academia to the private sector. I started my own company, and I wanted to start to see whether... Yep. I was applying everywhere, mostly the American Heart Association, um, you know, blood... No. No, no, but we, uh, we have, well, I put a lot of grants in, especially like career development grants for transition to, to faculty, and um, it was, everything was coming back that it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's too fringe, that, um, but went here. It's better now because now I'm helping patients. So um, what I wanted to do is take everything that I learned in academia, and this is sort of maybe a difference between my company and a lot of the other companies out there. I'm applying academic research to the production of products that are very effective in regenerative medicine. So using, the, um, using what I'd learned over 20 years, I started developing a few regenerative products, and now working with IMAC Regeneration Centers, um, we implement those, those products. Um, mostly we're focused on exosomes right now because exosomes contain a lot of uh, very powerful signaling molecules, and in fact, we use exosomes from amniotic fluid because these are exosomes from an environment of pro-growth and anti-inflammation, and that's really what we need for the most part in regenerative medicine. And so I want to give you an example of, so we've gone from you know, um, theoretical to the, the, the Petri dish, then to animal models, and now we're going to look at some clinical evidence. So this was a patient that for five years had sterile, steroid withdrawal syndrome. 
It's also called red skin syndrome. So she was like this for five years. All her legs, her arms, her chest, her face, um, and she was miserable. And nothing in conventional medicine could help her. Um, her physicians wanted to put her back on steroids because when she goes back on steroids, it would help sort of clean, clear it up a little bit, but then she would have issues with her adrenals again and she'd have to come off and then she'd have a huge bout like this again. So nothing in conventional medicine was helping her. So she came to IMAC. We gave her a dose of IV umbilical cord derived mononuclear cells plus exosomes, and this was the result one week later. So for five years, she was like this. One week later, this is, this is, this is the result. This is, her, this is her arm, this is her arm now. So she's she since had four doses, but it's been so effective, she's been featured in the news quite frequently. So if you want to look her up, um, you're welcome to. She's been interviewed quite a, um, a few times. Um, and this photo is, is quite um, lovely because for five years, her daughter's five, she wasn't able to hang out and play with her kids. She wasn't able to go swimming. Her daughter had never known her well. So this is the first time she was ever able to go into a swimming pool with her daughter. Um, so it's a really a, a remarkable story. And we have many, many um, stories like that as far as how the skin is responding to the anti-inflammatory effects of, of exosomes. So just because this is a, an aesthetics uh, talk, I just want to throw this in just quickly. This is from one of our physicians that uses our, uh, our exosomes. Um, our, uh, he's an aesthetics, uh, not at IMAC. This is a different facility. And this is just demonstrating that this, this lady had some work done on her lips. Um, she had some exosomes um, microneedled into her lips here. And this is the result three months later. So this physician has actually abandoned all use of Botox, and he's now using exclusively exosomes because he believes that the results are not only um, better, they're longer lasting, but also they're less detrimental because you're not in injecting um, uh, botulism into the, into the face. So uh, I've probably gone over time. I, I don't really know how long I've had. But um, it, in summary, um, I've talked about what stem cells are and what they aren't and what regenerative medicine is and, and what it isn't. Um, and the reason why we need regenerative medicine is because this evolutionary conserved mechanism in our bodies that eliminates us from the, from the environment. We're fighting against that. And that, that mechanism we term aging. We call it aging. So we, are, as regenerative medicine specialists, are fighting the process of aging through the use of um, perinatal products for the most part, at least um, in, our, in our case. So what we want to do is we want to Re uh, replenish the, uh, the lost stem cells with um, new stem cells that can go in, I'm sorry, new cells that can go in and revitalize the uh, depleting pool. Um, we understand now that the cells don't directly contribute to tissue, but they actually instruct the local tissue. And so why is that important? Well, because we don't have to use cells for the most part. You know, sometimes it's good to use cells because when you inject cells, they go to the site of inflammation and they interact with the environment. They're able to sense the environment and signal with the environment and change their phenotype based on the environment. Exosomes can't do that. But exosomes are very, very potent signalers. And so that's, that's why we utilize them for the most part. They're, not, they're acellular, so it's a little bit more compliant with the FDA. We actually have two TRIP requests in right now with the FDA, and we also have um, an IND um, pending. Um, and that's with exosomes. Um, so which exosomes are best for regenerative medicine? Well, there are lots of different exosome products out there, but we prefer exosomes from uh, amniotic fluid for the reasons I just mentioned, that these are from an environment of pro-regeneration, pro-growth, and anti-inflammation. You know, the mother and the, the fetus, they, can't, they, they, they have to communicate, and they can't reject one another. So the immune system's modulated, and during this window, we can harvest those um, products and use them therapeutically. So they're actually able to, for the most part, avoid the immune system and um, uh, elicit repair. So I'm asked a lot what I recommend as far as exosomes and cells. I mean, I'm not a physician, so I can't recommend therapies. But I, from a scientific perspective, what I can say is that exosomes are very acute. So when you inject exosomes, there's a very potent anti-inflammatory effect, and it's very quick. It happens very fast. I don't have the videos today, but we have stroke patients that actually start responding within minutes to hours of receiving them IV because the inflammation has decreased. Um, Exosomes work very, very fast, but then they're gone. Stem cells take, uh, sorry, cells take a little while to get going, cellular therapy takes a little while to get going, but they stick around longer. So what you tend to get is this one-two punch if you add them together. You get this very acute um, effect that's then protracted by the, uh, the addition of cells. So what you do is you mediate more and more repair over time. So a lot of people like to use exosomes to modulate the immune system to kick things off um, in conjunction with IV therapy and then supplement with, um, with cells, whether they're uh, SVF, bone marrow or, or perinatal cells. 
Um, and that's it. So then just some uh, references there, but I'm happy to take uh, questions. Yep. And then the repair happens, but I'm just thinking, you know, six months after, a year after, when their the cells are dying off, you yep. need to give another external uh, injection. Yeah. Off the so we're in the. Okay. You have to take it off. I don't know where it is. I can't see it. Can you take this one off? Yeah, sure. Shut it off. Hello? So we're in the process right now of putting in, um, uh, we're writing an IRB for an IND application for frailty with exosomes. Um, and uh, I, I can't go into the details of the protocol, but basically this is gonna be something that aging people would need on a regular basis. So we're gonna have probably, I think it's four treatments over the course of the year, so quarterly, um, because you know, the body is not gonna stop aging. Um, what we can do is we can improve the quality of the life and we can slow it down um, I believe actually the human body is immortal, um, and it is, um, but we just have this endogenous mechanism in our genes that's, that's intended um, to re remove us. You know, whether you're a dandelion uh, or, or an elephant, you have to make way for the next generation in order to take advantage of the, 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 um, the environment and the resources. So if we can overcome that innate need to age, we can essentially live forever. Um, and what we're doing on a very small part is, is extending that. So with the exosomes, we're able to re uh, revitalize our endogenous stem cell pools, which then just give us that extra bit of time, but still we have that genetic component that's forcing us down the aging route. So then we need to give exosomes again, then we need to give exosomes again. If we're talking about regeneration, if we're trying to re uh, regenerate a, um, a surgical site, we can apply exosomes or other regenerative products there. That's a one-time deal. Once it's regenerated, you're good to go. But if you're talking about anti-aging or if you're talking about aesthetics, this is going to have to be something that's going to be um, applied because you know, we're fighting uh, a rising tide there. Yep. Heat? Aesthetically? You mean on the face? Um, well, the skin is a very strong barrier against entry for obvious reasons. So if you're trying to put something in the skin, you have to break that barrier in order to get it in. So um, heat, lasers, um, microneedling, all these things cause injuries and are able to drive the exosomes into the skin. Otherwise, they will just sit peripherally and actually not have any effect at all. So I can't go into the details of, of that too much. I'm not a physician, but I can tell you that in our clinics, the physicians do use oxygen chambers to improve the um, efficacy of some of the treatments. And, um, but I don't know the details of that. I'm, I'm exclusively in the lab, not in the clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, if there's anything else, oh, yeah, go ahead. Most recently, yeah. Alan Nevy? No. No, from, um, from Lois Pope? Yeah, my, my project? No, I never worked with him. I was working with Joshua Hare in cardiac regeneration at the time. I was trying to do a collaboration between Lois Pope and us because of the nerve um, component, but we never got past um, the application phase. Why use cellular therapy instead of exosomes? Yeah, so um, again, I, I, I try not to use the word stem cell too much because really, if, if we're talking about stem cell and regenerative medicine, we're talking about ES cells that are differentiated into tissue and then applied in a regenerative case. Um, but cellular therapy is still, I think, a critical component to um, these treatments because the cells, like I said, can interact with the environment. Exosomes, they don't whatever's in them at the time you apply them, that's what's in them. They don't change. They just burst open or, or actually, for the most part, they, they, um, they find a cell and they fuse with the cell and they, they deliver their cargo. 
Um, but they don't change, but the cells can change. So the cells can go to the site of injury and they can respond to what's needed there and change the genetics, well, don't change the genetics, but they, they activate different genes in order to produce different proteins that can then be um, applied, but exosomes cannot do that. So if you're talking about inflammation, exosomes are amazing, amazing. Um, but if you're talking about tissue regeneration, it seems that cells are really important because they can really instruct, especially with MSCs, they actually deliver um, um, mitochondria. Exosomes can't do that. So that's an, an important component of the regenerative process is being able to re revitalize the endogenous cells that are senescent. And you can do that with the delivery of um, the mitochondria. And only, so only the cells can do that. 